Hello, hello, Mordimers here and welcome to another part of Akiba Rubinstein saga. But before we start the analysis of the game, I would like to share my huge gratitude with you because for the first time in the history of my channel, I got the Patreon supporter. Uh, it happened two weeks ago, but I just checked my emails and, and I just got this information. So sorry for uh, being a bit late, uh, but Danny Stoll uh, contributed to my channel for the real really first time i'm extremely happy uh, so thank you very much danny and now let's jump into the game so the game of course was played in Karlsbad but 1907 uh, in the tournament which Akiba Rubinstein, I show you already two games um, of this tournament of Akiba Rubinstein uh, and this time I would like to show you another end game, this time opposite color bishops and now I choose that game because it appears in a lot of books, uh, chess books about the end games, I, I analyze at least three authors so definitely uh, informations are uh, pretty interesting but I also of course add added my uh, stockfish analysis and I found some new lines which were not analyzed, uh, you know, during the 100 years because Max Uwe was the first who analyzed that game and show a lot of lines. And then in the end of the 20th century, we still had the authors who analyzed this game as, as the example of very beautiful played uh, end game by Akiba Rubinstein. Uh, his opponent, Paul Joner, Paul Joner was from Switzerland. Uh, he was 19 years old only, but he was already a very strong player. Uh, he won the Switzerland Championship. So he was the champion of Switzerland in 1907, then in 1908 and then three more times in the future. Uh, his ranking according to the chess metrics 2445. In this game he's going to play as wide and his opponent of course Akiba Rubinstein 2724. Definitely a uh, favorite of this game. Uh, he was number five in the world, 24 years old, uh, and in this game he's going to play as black. So without further ado, let's see what happened on the board. Uh, I will show you just opening, but not much into the theory as I show you the uh, this opening plenty of times. So knight f3, knight c6, we have bishop b5, Rui Lopez on the board, Morf Morphy defense a6, we have bishop a4, we have knight f6, uh, we have a castle, bishop e7, this is common theory, Rook e1 taking care of this uh, of this pawn now. We have b5 kicking the bishop, bishop b3, and now d6. Uh, we also have c3 preparing d4, uh, and now bishop g4. And nowadays, uh, mostly what is played, the modern theory says uh, play h3, and after a bishop h5, play d3. So that's how it should be played, or sometimes a d3 can be played first, and after the, the castle. Uh, knight b to d2 and this knight is heading to the f1 uh, and then to g3 sometimes also to e3 uh, and from there can you know uh, go to another square so uh, pretty interesting and pretty uh, standard but we have d4 immediately uh, which is not that great however it's still very much playable we have the castle uh, we have the a4 now challenging the pawn on b5 uh, and now we have rook e8 uh, just for your information the modern theory says that black stands slightly better here just have to play bishop f3 and after g takes on f3 first uh, focus on this bishop bishop c2 and after knight h5 white are in trouble it's not easy position uh, probably white have to give up one of the pawns play something like f4 uh, just to bring the bishop and then the knight to the game as fast as possible and this is uh, considered as the as the best way to do that uh, otherwise the bishop and the queen can get very easily to the uh, to the king side and that can be also very very dangerous also some moves like f5 uh, bringing the rook to the open file this can be also very dangerous so after knight f4 bishop f4 e takes on f4 a modern theory says it's slightly better for black uh, however we have rook e8 by akiba rubinstein he didn't know the 21st century theory yet we have bishop d5 now pinning the knight queen d7 defending uh, and now d 
takes on e5. Uh, we have knight d5, we have e takes on d5, knight e5, now this knight is pinned, uh, so of course attacking the knight is uh, always a good thing in this um, case, and now we have knight e5, saying if you take my queen, I'm gonna take your queen as well. So this is why we have d takes on e5, and now it looks like white can win that pawn. Of course, the, the queen is under attack, but what if white plays f3? Actually, it doesn't work because after bishop f5 and rook e5, this rook is lost. I hope you see that. Bishop c5 with the check, discover attack on the rook, and of course, black would win that game. So this is why we have queen b3, pretty natural. And now bishop d6, defending the pawn on e5 twice. We have a takes on b5, a takes on b5, rook a8, rook a8, uh, and now knight a3 attacking the pawn on b5 twice. So now what to do? It looks like this pawn gonna be lost. Uh, if black tries to play something like rook b8, the problem is that c4 attacks this pawn again. Uh, and if b4, then the, the knight can jump to b5. And this is a really great outpost for the knight. Uh, and it's very difficult actually to even imagine that this pawn can be defended as the bishop can come to the d2 uh, and attack um, this pawn. So that's not that easy. So rook b8 would not work. This is why we have rook a5. It looks like the, the rook is quite passive. Uh, and now here Yoner should play something like first let's make uh, some space for the king just you know to protect the first rank and weakness on the on the first rank bishop h5 and only then bishop d2. And now the idea is c4 and black doesn't have any good moves here actually to refute that. So for example queen e8 and after c4 the bishop attacking the the rook but of course b takes on c4 first with the attack on the queen so knight c4 first and then the rook can come uh, to b5, knight d6, uh, c takes on d6, and now queen a2, uh, and the queen is still protecting the pawn on d5. Moreover, white have the passed pawn. So this position was possible to actually uh, reach by Yoner, however, he immediately played c4 a little bit too early. Now we have b takes on c4, and uh, knight takes on c4, we have rook d5. So this is the difference, this pawn is actually lost. Uh, and now it looks like, okay, but we have a tactic here, knight b6. Yes, we have, but it doesn't work. Black simply can uh, exchange the queens and get to the better endgame. So rook b5, knight d7, rook b3, and after knight e5 winning back the material, simply bishop go back to e6 and pair of bishops should be uh, superior in the endgame. So Akiba Rubinstein shouldn't have the problem uh, in capitalizing that. So it doesn't really work um, with the jumping with the knight to b6. Uh, so this is why we have knight d6. And of course Akiba cannot take with the pawn because the rook is hanging. So that is the, the problem. This is why we have queen d6 uh, and now queen b8. We also have queen d8. Eight, queen d8, rook d8, and this position appear in a lot of books, especially about the endgames book, um, as the example of how to realize, you know, one extra pawn endgame with the opposite color bishops. We, of course, have the rook, so that's a little bit easier, but it's still far, far away from being easy. Now, what would you play as white to defend that position? According to the a lot of analysis, uh, f4 is the way to go. Now, the point is, um, if we play f4 and if black starts, for example, e4, um, then we can take that pawn. And of course, uh, black cannot win the bishop because uh, there is the checkmate on e8. So that's the first problem. Uh, so have to play something like bishop e6 and this bishop can be, uh, of course, uh, saved or moved. So that's the first thing. Now, if black simply takes the pawn, uh, then we're gonna have bishop f4. Now this pawn is under attack, c6, uh, and now bishop d2. Uh, and again, the bishop cannot be taken, so something like f6, and now bishop c3. And it's uh, very difficult to imagine that this bishop gonna be taken ever, um, this bishop gonna stay on this diagonal, and it cannot be, you know, taken from there, can be exchanged only for the rook. So 
so it's it's actually impossible for Akiba Rubinstein um, to you know force anything on the queen side uh, and on the king side three pawns against two pawns that also would be extremely difficult um, to make any any advantage uh, also if f6 is played then of course f takes on e5 f takes on e5 and black gonna have this weakness uh, what white can play bishop g5 attack the rook and win one of the pawns so if the rook tries to defend then of course we're gonna have bishop f4 and this pawn is attacked twice so that's the first problem if he's pushed then this pawn gonna be lost uh, and if the rook goes to d5 uh, we're gonna have rook c1 winning this pawn and if it's defended, uh, then of course we're gonna have rook c5 winning this pawn. So this way or another, uh, you cannot save everything. Even if the pawn is pushed, then the bishop can actually attack um, this pawn. And if the pawn is pushed, then it's gonna be taken. So this way or another, white gonna uh, gonna win the pawn, except uh, black decide to exchange the rooks, but that's also uh, gonna be the draw. So uh, f4 was the way to go, the easiest way to actually draw that. However, we have first inaccuracy by Yoner and we have f3. So bishop e6 uh, and now uh, rook e5 doesn't work again because of course we're gonna have rook d1 and there is no mate on the 8th rank so uh, white would lose the game so that's not possible this is why king f2 first uh, and now rook d5 defending the pawn uh, and now it seems like the best plan for white uh, would be actually follow bringing the bishop to the c3. It's not that easy here. I mean, you can play something like rook e2. That's the easiest way. And even if black plays something like rook d1, trying to catch the bishop, uh, then we're gonna have this rook d2 forcing to exchange the rooks. Of course, if the, the rook moves to take the bishop or somewhere else, we're gonna have again the checkmate. So rook d2, and again, we would have... Uh, the draw. Uh, also, if f6 is played and defending that, everything looks pretty much fun. Uh, but bishop d2 and, as I said, bishop c3 is the main plan, main idea what white should play in that position. So keep in mind, if you have similar position, uh, start to, you know, build some kind of fortress, make the position extremely solid and, you know, your opponent have to find a way to break. But with the opposite colors, bishops is uh, extremely difficult. Uh, Yoner played b4, so he moved the pawn, he was thinking maybe I can bring the bishop to c5 and it's gonna be the same, however here the bishop of course gonna be on this diagonal, uh, not that active, uh, maybe also on this diagonal, but um, it's not that great. So this is just another inaccuracy, it's not the losing, uh, but white have to be more and more uh, precise. So already we, we see the difference in classes of the players. Uh, we have have h6 very simple move preparing for g5 f5 uh, attacking on the on the king side uh, grabbing more space we have g3 we have bishop d7 now uh, and now we have bishop e3 uh, we have f5 as planned we have rook c1 going after the pawn we have c6 now the pawn is defended uh, and now rook c2 we have king f7 uh, and here was probably the last moment where white should try to play f4 now it looks like suicide because after f4 we're gonna have e4 uh, but after rook d2 it's not that easy actually to uh, save that rook, the exchange, because the bishop is before. So probably rook d2 exchanging. Uh, and then simply after king e6, bring the bishop to e3 as planned. Uh, king d5, bring the bishop to c5. Uh, and after king c4, the king can stay on e3. And it's again very difficult to imagine that black gonna make any progress here. The king gonna simply stay on e3 and this uh, bishop can can actually you know move uh, here and there and always defend keep an eye on the pawn on the on the b4 so uh, it's impossible to make any progress uh, but we have king e2 it looks like very logical move uh, it covers the the squares and so the the rook um, cannot access over there uh, but it's not that great as well so another inaccuracy we have g5 by akiba rubinstein and now 
f4 th this would be too late now because f4 g takes on f4 g takes on f4 e takes on f4 bishop f4 and now rook d4 wins one of the pawns so this pawn is lost or this pawn is lost you cannot you can save this pawn uh, but then of course this pawn gonna be lost it cannot be defended so you cannot, of course, defend the, the pawn. So that is the that is the problem. Uh, but the owner have his own plan. Bishop c5. This is how he wanted to um, to stay with the pawn and the bishop. It looks like pretty much solid. Uh, and now we have f4. We have rook a2, uh, making the the rook more active. That's the principle of the end games, especially rook end games. Uh, we have bishop f5 now because rook wanted to come to a7 and pin that bishop. Uh, now now we have g takes on f4 uh, and now bishop d3 with the check first we have king e1 uh, and only now g takes on f4 we have rook a7 with check king g6 uh, and now rook e7 focusing on the on the e5 pawn as this pawn definitely wanted to make the pawn break and uh, now it's not possible we have bishop b5 now uh, akiba rubinstein also make his position extremely solid and now we have rook e6 um, delivering a check we have a king g7 uh, and this way actually akiba set up a little trap now uh, what is the point the point is it looks like white can win that pawn uh, but the problem is this is a trap so the best way to draw this is another chance for the draw um, for paul dioner is rook d6 and now this rook, of course, uh, cannot move anywhere. So in the right moment, white can exchange the rooks. For now, doesn't need to. Uh, so for example, king f7 and just play, uh, you know, king f2. And if the kings are moved, um, then just repeat and black doesn't have any chances to make any progress. And of course, the king cannot come to the rook uh, because that would be extreme blunder and that would be lost the game. So again, uh, rook d6 was the way to draw that game again uh, however we have bishop d6 saying okay i'm gonna win your pawn and akiba rubinstein say okay but not this one i need the central pawn um, and he played king f7 saying okay now you don't have a choice you cannot take that pawn because i'm gonna take your bishop uh, all you can do is actually um, take this pawn because if you play something like rook e7 uh, i'm gonna play king f6 your bishop is under attack and what you're gonna play uh, next if you move the bishop uh, let's say uh, bishop c5 still keeping an eye on the on the rook the problem is rook can take the bishop uh, and of course this rook gonna be lost as well so this way or another it's gonna be uh, the piece gonna be lost if you play rook d7 then of course king e6 also winning the piece so uh, it's not even possible to make any decision here. Uh, this is why we have rook h6 by Yoner, so at least he has the passed pawn. But it's not a really great passed pawn so far, at least according to all the analyses I found in all the books. We have rook d3 now attacking the pawn. Uh, if bishop e5, we of course gonna have rook e3 uh, winning the bishop, so that's not possible. This is why king f2 first defending the pawn uh, and now rook e3. And look at this rook. It looks like black pieces start to play better and better, get the better and better positions. For example, rook e2 uh, in the right moment can be played. And now this position was analyzed plenty of times. However, nobody found that rook h5. But Stockfish uh, just uh, gives a couple of suggestions and it's not the strongest one. But what would you play uh, for rook h5? It's a very interesting question because now this pawn is attacked twice if you play e4 immediately then simply f takes on e4 rook e4 and yes rook f5 doesn't work that that is tricky because after rook f5 it looks like uh, white actually can win the pawn but it's uh, not really the case here because after king e6 uh, black always have this check first and then can take the bishop for free uh, but of course R R rook h6 can be played and the king again is the trapped on the 7 and 8 rank so e4 immediately would not work if 
if king e6 defending the pawn, uh, then simply bishop b8 and staying on this diagonal uh, also can be very, very powerful if needed. But for now, the bishop want to stay uh, and focus on e5. Now, the point is that e4 doesn't work uh, immediately because of rook e5 and this pawn gonna be lost. So king f6, uh, rook e4, uh, rook e4, f takes on e4. And this, of course, is better for white. So black also have to be very careful, uh, cannot push in the, in the wrong moment. And if play something like rook e2, then king g1. Uh, and then after king d5, it looks like this king uh, can make some progress, but at the end, this bishop gonna be very very um, dangerous here so for example h4 then king d4 bishop a7 uh, king d3 uh, and what next rook f5 and this pawn cannot be pushed again because this pawn is hanging um maybe something like rook e1 uh but then king g2 and and what next now e4 uh, simply rook f4 and yes, black can actually uh, create the passed pawn by e3, uh, but then rook d4 kicking the king first, uh, king c2, and after rook e4, uh, this pawn uh, can go to e2, but after, let's say, h5, uh, rook d1 making a space for the pawn, uh, this bishop always can come to f2 and be exchanged. So uh, not much can be done here. Uh, maybe rook d5 going after the pawn h6, uh, rook h5, then rook h4, and as you already see, uh, this is very difficult to, to win. So black would have to uh, move, but this bishop will always cover, um, you know, e1, and it's uh, very difficult to even imagine. So this was probably the way to go with the rook h5 and try to focus um, together with the bishop on the, on the pawn on e5. Uh, however, we have bishop c5, pretty much logical, uh, bring the bishop to this diagonal, uh, however, of course, white lose all the, all the counterplay here, uh, and of course, we have now rook e2 with the check, king g1, and here Akiba Rubinstein decided that he want to exchange the pawn on the c6 for the pawn on the f3. So what is the idea? The idea is two connected past pawns gonna be very, very powerful. And he play bishop c4. Uh, and now Max Ove, who actually uh, commented that game, he analyzed it very deeply, said that this pawn cannot be defended. And the point is that after rook h3, we gonna have king g6, uh, and let's say bishop e7, then bishop e6, uh, rook h8 because the rook is under attack but now the bishop can come back to d5 and after rook h3 this time play rook e3 uh, and now this pawn is attacked twice and if it's defended for example king g2 now e4 is the way to go right now and the point is f takes on e4 bishop e4 and the rook is lost so the rook here gonna be lost. Um, it just cannot be defended, okay? So uh, rook h3 defending doesn't work. This is why in the game we have rook c6 uh, and now bishop d5. Uh, we have rook d6, we have bishop f3 and now h4. So creating the passed pawn and now using it. Why not to push it? We have e4 by Akiba Rubinstein and here is the moment of the game. Uh, none of the books actually cover that but according to stockfish stockfish believes that uh, going after the f4 pawn is at least drawing the game and it's very difficult to imagine that that it can happen but look at this pawn this pawn cannot be defended it's blocked by the bishop so it cannot be pushed so how to do that actually paul yoner found a way but it was not the right way the right way you actually can pause the video uh, and try to find the solution which was not found uh, by you know uh, a lot of analyzers of this game a lot of comments Commentators, uh, a lot of you know chess book authors didn't find the continuation but stockfish says that white can actually draw this game while i enjoy my cup of tea okay ready i show you already the motive so that should be easier we want to win that pawn how to do that so the way to go is rook d8 
And now the point is that the rook is going to come to f8 and win the pawn. So what are the options? First, uh, let's push the pawn uh, and try to play this way. Uh, then we're going to have rook f8 with the check. We're going to have king g6, let's say, rook f4. Uh, and now how you going to continue? Uh, let's say rook e1 with the check, king h2, rook h1, kicking the king, uh, king g3, now e2. And now the pawn gonna promote, but of course this bishop can come back to f2. And now this bishop is under attack, so bishop b7. And now even if black actually promote to the queen and win the bishop, this is completely not winning for black. It looks like, okay, it's winning uh, one extra piece, but black doesn't have any more pawns. So yes, if these two pawns are lost, it's still not that easy actually to win. According to the theory, if we have rook and the bishop against the rook, uh, then it's winning for the side with the bishop, but only in Philidor position. And Philidor position is uh, when the king is on, on the on the one of the sides and the king is in the opposition. And then it's very, very tricky. It's possible to win. However, there are a couple of ways to draw. So first in the 18th and 19th century, we have a couple of authors who study that. A Cochrane defense, that is the one of the ways to, uh, to defend. Then we're going to have second rank defense, uh, another way of doing. Then we have the Joseph Sen position and um, this is another way of drawing and we have second lolly position and this was actually uh, from the 18th century so it was analyzed in the 18th century so it would be very very difficult uh, to actually win for Akiba Rubinstein at this kind of position um, if rook d8 is played so what are other options maybe king e6 and try to defend that pawn still we have rook f8 uh, king e5 rook e8 and now if you play king d5 you're gonna have rook f8 uh, again uh, and threefold repetition if you try to defend it uh, and if not and play something like rook g2 king f1 and rook g4 defend this way it looks pretty good but then we're gonna have h5 just pushing uh, e3 and it looks like black are okay here there is the problem again bishop e3 sacrifice the bishop uh, if the pawn takes then of course this bishop is lost uh, if the bishop makes some intermezzo move bishop g2 with the check king f2 f takes on e3 king e3 and again we have the rook and the bishop for the rook and uh, this pawn gonna be lost definitely but it still should be a draw uh, and again the last try rook g2 uh, king f1 and defend that pawn immediately with the rook. Again, we have rook f8, king e6, uh, we have h5, uh, we have bishop g2 with the idea of pushing that pawn. The problem is, uh, if this pawn is pushed any time, uh, then the king gonna stay on e3 and also it's very difficult now um, to actually continue that. There are some possibilities, maybe the king could come to g5 uh, and try to go for the for the f5. I'm not sure if, if this would work. Uh, let's try. Uh, then h6 can be played. Uh, and then if this rook is played, ah, then simply rook f5, rook f5, and this pawn gonna win the game. So that's that's also doesn't work. So yeah, so it seems like rook d8 with the idea of rook f8 and winning this pawn is the way to go. Congratulations if you found it. You are better than a lot of authors of the books and, and you know, commentators. However, Paul Yoner uh, found this idea, however, he played bishop d4. So the idea is very simple, win that pawn this way. But this way doesn't work. Akiba Rubinstein plays rook d2, pinning the bishop, so the bishop has nowhere to go. We have bishop e5 and only now e3. So now the bishop cannot attack the, the pawn on e3, that is the problem. Uh, we have bishop f4 winning the pawn and now you can pause the video one more time and find the only winning continuation for Rubinstein, uh, what he had in mind uh, with the, you know, sacrificing yet another pawn on f4. While I enjoy my cup of tea. Okay, ready? 
So the winning continuation is rook g2 check. And after this move, Paul Yoner resign. And he resigned because he has to move. If he moved, of course, here, he's gonna lose the bishop and the game. So uh, actually, this is completely lost, of course. Uh, and he, if he goes to f1, then we're gonna have e2, uh, king e1, and now rook g1 with the check, and then uh, promote to the queen. And this, of course, is winning for black as well. So this is why after rook g2, he didn't expect probably uh, he resigned. So that was another game of Akiba Rubinstein. I really hope you enjoyed that and you learned something new uh, from that game. A little inaccuracies here and there. And this is the way and um, how you can try to win the game, you know, with the central pawns. Maybe if they are connected, they can be really powerful. Uh, but still, a lot of tricks, a very tricky game, and I'm very surprised uh, that a lot of people, a lot of grandmasters didn't find this um, rook d8. This is very interesting maneuver. Uh, if I miss something, please drop the comment, maybe I miss something, uh, but yeah. If you like this video, press like. If for some reason you don't like it, press unlike. And if you don't want to miss other games of Akiba Rubinstein Saga, press subscribe, smash the bell button. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one.